Well, it's good to see you again. Thank you for watching this uh, video. I really appreciate it. And uh, I know that there are different reasons why you watch. Most of you are teachers and you're going to be teaching. And I pray for you and I pray for you in your class regularly because what you do is so incredibly important to the uh, mission of the church, making disciples. We want to make sure that we think about these four E's. Exalt Jesus Christ. We want to equip the saints, the believers, for the works of ministry. We want to evangelize the lost. And we also want to be ready for any encounter that we may have with the culture or with the world. How do we do that? We do that by teaching the Bible. That's the command. And the command to the pastor in the pastoral epistles is preach the word and be instant in season and out of season. So we are doing a little bit of disciple making as we go through all of this. We're all learning, praying, fellowshipping, and working together. So we're kind of all on the same page. And we also are getting ready to teach other people. You'll be teaching on Sunday morning. I'll be teaching on Sunday morning. This is a lesson for September the 1st of 2024. <clears throat> It's kind of an illusion in my mind, but boy, that date sounds good. There's something about September that we kind of go, huh, finally through the dog days of summer. Of course, most of the time we're fooling ourselves because September is a pretty hot month too, for the most part. But fall is on its way and football and the fun things that we do. And uh, I want you to be thinking and already begin to be praying about things that are coming up and things that are going to be happening. We'll have a fall festival and that'll be a community event. We'll have our Thanksgiving dinner and that too will be an event that we can invite our friends and family members to. And then we move full swing into the holidays where we can complain about the cold instead of uh, about the heat. But for right now, we are in September and we're heading that direction. So be thinking about that. Be thinking about fellowships for your class. Be thinking about any ministry that you can do. And also be thinking about outreach. We want to get the number of our visitors every week to go up. And we want to have people join our classes as well as joining our church. We want them to come and to be saved. And so there are all kinds of ways during this time of year that we can reach out to people. So I want to encourage you to do that. That's part of our mission as a Sunday school teacher, not just to come and to teach the Bible. My father-in-law did a Sunday school seminar, oh, decades ago at a church I was at. And um, I wasn't even the pastor. But he came in to talk to the Sunday school teachers. And he said, how many of you think that your job is to teach the Bible? And everybody raised their hand. I think I probably did too. I was in my 20s. And he said, that's not your job. He goes, the Bible doesn't need to know anything. You don't teach the Bible, you teach people. And I've never forgotten that. And so I want that to be something that we think about. Your job is not just to teach whoever shows up. Your job is to recruit people, to check on people, to have people there and then teach them the word of God. And we want to grow and we want to expand and multiply in all of that. And you say, well, my room doesn't have enough space for all of that. Then good, then we'll start a new class or something like that. That's the way we want to think and the way we want to try to multiply as we reach people. Now we are looking as we have been for some time now, I hope you've enjoyed it, at the life of Abraham. And we were talking today when we were in our staff meeting about this, that doing a study like this over a person and over a character, it uh, kind of takes away some of your uh, illusions about this person. Abraham was not some uh, super duper holy man, you know, who lived and walked uh, with God. He was holy and he did walk with God, but he was a lot more human than most of us would ever think about. And he had to deal with human problems. He had to figure out how to have water for his camels to drink. And he had to uh, provide shelter for his family and for his servants. He had to, have, to be able to feed all of them. He had to get along with neighboring um, tribes and clans that were in Canaan. Uh, they didn't see him with a halo or anything like that. He was just a, an invader, just another person who was competing with them for water and for pasture and 
all of those kind of things. So in the midst of everything you see with his encounters with God and the covenant, he had to live everyday life and his everyday life was a whole lot harder than yours or mine ever has been. It was a fight for survival every single day. Well, didn't he have the promise of God? Didn't he have faith in God? Of course, but he still had to haul water from the well. He still had to make sure that the crops would grow. He still had to make sure that the sheep and the goats had uh, green grass to eat, all of those kind of things, just like we do. And uh, yet when you look back on all of it, if we could talk to him today, he would say, yeah, I went out and I sweated and I toiled and I searched and I prayed and sometimes probably worried more than, than he should have. And yet he would say, God led me all the way and took care of me all the way. And one day we'll have that uh, privilege too when we get to heaven to see that those things where we were sweating it out, where we weren't sure what we were going to do or how we were going to make it, and we'll find that God kept all of his promises. And that's really what this story about Abraham is about, the faithfulness of God. And yet at the same time, let's give Abraham credit, he was faithful to God, well, for the most part. But like us, he slipped up from time to time. But now he's getting old. And uh, he looks out there and the runway is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Sarah has died. He's grieving. He's missing his spouse. He's watching Isaac as he is growing up. And he uh, comes to the realization that we've got to make plans for the future. Yes, God is in control. Yes, God is going to take care of all of that kind of thing. But the sovereignty of God never gives us permission to be apathetic or to be passive. The Bible tells us, for example, in salvation that God is sovereign and the elect are going to be saved. But at the same time, how are they saved? Paul said, how shall they hear unless there is a preacher, meaning a proclaimer, a town crier, not an ordained minister, but somebody who tells them the story. And we're to go into all the world and we are to preach the gospel in the Great Commission, Jesus said. So we are to be faithful as well. And don't you see that in this story? Abraham was faithful to God, but more than that, God was faithful to Abraham. And in this particular part of the life of Abraham, he sends Eliezer on a mission. He said, I don't want Isaac to marry somebody that is from the Canaanites. They won't respect the covenant. They won't respect the inheritance. It'll be a mess. I want you to go find somebody from my tribe, from my clan, one of my relatives, and I want you to find a wife for Isaac and then bring him back here. Well, what if they won't come, Eliezer said? Then you're free from the oath. But God is in this, so go. And we see the providence of God all the way through this that it all lined up, Eliezer comes to the right place at the right time and meets Rebecca and everything falls according to how he had prayed. And then lo and behold, it turns out that she is of the same clan that Abraham came from so many years before. And this whole story is a story of Eliezer being faithful to Abraham and Abraham being faithful to Eliezer just as God was faithful to Abraham and Abraham to uh, God. And so there's this wonderful cooperation here that, that goes on. And so we've entitled this, as we uh, think about this, Eliezer's Honorable Service is Displayed. Now, one of the things that uh, coming from a military family like I do, I can remember those times when my dad would advance in rank or he would get a, a specific commendation. They would have a ceremony and my mom would maybe pin a, another medal on his chest and then he would have a ribbon to signify that so he didn't have to wear heavy uh, ribbons all over the place because he had a lot of them. And uh, that was a display of honor, a display of honor. Anybody who saw that could tell my dad had been a combat veteran in Korea they could see that he had received two purple hearts. They could see that he was a sharpshooter. They could see those kind of things. Then they could also tell that he had been, as a chaplain, he had been to Vietnam. And uh, they could see other commendations that he was also uh, one who served in the military during the Cold War. All of those things were there because that is something that builds respect 
and uh, honor, and it uh, influences the way people in the military treat one another. You obviously treat a captain or a major differently than you would a private first class or a recruit during basic training. You would also notice when you looked at people, I aspire to have some of those medals, to have some of those ribbons. I want to have honorable service. I want to get an honorable discharge. Maybe if you make a career out of it, you want to retire as well. All of those kind of things are put on display in the military everywhere you go, even your house. The post housing we lived on, they had a nameplate that would have my dad's rank and it would have his name on there too. And officers lived in a different place than the uh, enlisted people lived and things like that. So, and, and it even made a difference even when we would go to school. Uh, oh, your dad's an officer. Yeah, I can remember people saying that. And so uh, this is what is happening with, Eli happening with Eliezer. His honorable service to Abraham is being put on display. And a pretty significant part of the story of Abraham concerns this. So Eliezer reading the introduction, was faithful as a servant and a steward. He was in charge of the economics of Abraham's household, and that was a lot. He had a lot of money, a lot of sheep, a lot of goats, a lot of servants. And he had responsibility, and he showed that he was capable and trustworthy. Some people that are capable are not trustworthy. Some people that are trustworthy are not capable. Eliezer had both. And every step of the way, he was laser focused. And as we go through this series during this month, kind of finishing up this particular part of the story, you're going to find that Eliezer always had his eye on God and he always had his eye and his heart on Abraham, his master. So we look in uh, chapter 24 of Genesis and we look at verse 29. Now remember, he's met Rebekah. And uh, it says in verse 29, Now Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. Later on you'll read about Laban as it relates to uh, Rebekah's son Jacob. Remember that? And Laban ran out to the man by the well. That would be speaking of Eliezer. Verse 30. So it came to pass when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist, and when he heard the words of his sister Rebekah, saying, Thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man. He wants to hear it from the horse's mouth, we might say. And uh, there he stood by the camels at the well, speaking of Eliezer. And he, Laban, said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord, why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Well, then the man, Eliezer, came to the house. And he unloaded the camels, because he carried a lot of stuff with him. And he provided straw and feed for the camels and water to wash the feet. And the feet, look at this, of the men who were with him, meaning Eliezer. He had an entourage. Now it says in verse 33, food was set before him to eat, but he said, look at this laser focus we talked about. I will not eat until I have told about my errand. And he, Laban, said, speak on. And we'll cover more of that next week. But let's think about this so far. Number one, Eliezer followed the traditional and legal procedures here. He meets up with Rebecca and he finds out that she meets all of the qualifications. She's a young woman, she's beautiful, she's a virgin, and she is of the clan, the uh, tribe, the family um, of Abraham, meets all of those qualifications. And so uh, notice that he didn't just take her. I mean, I doubt that with him and with all of the men that he had with him, they probably could have just grabbed her, tied her up, put her on a camel, and uh, they would have run for their lives, right? I'm sure that happened in those days. I'm sure there were different tribes and different people that would come along and they would steal women, uh, children maybe, to make slaves out of them or whatever, 
wives or uh, prostitutes or anything like that. But Eliezer is different. He's not like your ordinary guy. He's a moral man. He's an honorable man. He wants to do everything right. Now, think about this. The last thing Eliezer wants is to bring a bride back for Isaac and for Isaac and this bride to have children only to have a neighboring tribe from uh, wherever Laban was from, Mesopotamia, to come and to attack to try to take them back because that kind of thing happened as well. So he wants everything to be clear. He wants it to be above board and he respects the traditions here of the uh, culture and of the family and he's going to do the honorable thing. So he waits. Even though he has said to Rebecca, do you have a place for me to lodge? Even though uh, she has indicated that they do, he doesn't make any kind of move. He stays put. And so when Rebecca tells Laban about the situation with this stranger that she met and watered his camels and all of that, and Laban can see the ring in her nose and the bracelets that she had. Where did you get those? And so uh, he wants to go out and see for himself and he wants to hear it for himself. Now, Laban is not Rebecca's father. That uh, looks like Bethuel. Bethuel would be the way it's pronounced. And he apparently is too old to be too engaged in all of this. He's still alive and he does some things, but not a whole lot. Laban's the guy in charge of all of this. And so he goes to see for himself and make sure this man is not a creep, to make sure this man is not going to abuse his sister, to make sure this man is above board. And so uh, notice that um, Eliezer wants to meet with the family. And the family authority here was respected. And even though Bethuel is uh, elderly here, Laban and Eliezer are acting in his best interest and the family's best interest. He's not just tossed aside. He's not just completely ignored. This is our time, old man. It's not anything like that. They respected old people in those days. And so he doesn't want any dishonor to come upon Abraham or Isaac. Can you imagine if the rumor came about that they were just a marauding tribe who went in and kidnapped somebody that was a woman for Isaac? That would be a, a bad, bad situation all the way around. So that's what we see first. Secondly, we see this. Rebecca was actually honored. Now for people who say that the Bible doesn't really honor women and it puts them down, they don't like the idea of submission or anything like that at all. That sounds demeaning and all of that. But when you really look carefully, the Bible, especially for the time and the place where it was written, it really elevates women. When you think about the times which Rebecca lived, nobody would ever ask her opinion. Nobody would care what she thought. But in this situation, she is really treated well and really honored by Eliezer. And so uh, notice how Laban says in verse uh, 30, came to pass when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist and he heard the words of his sister Rebecca. Uh, isn't that amazing? He listened. He paid attention to her. He got the story from her and then he went out to meet the man himself to check it all out and to kind of hear for himself. I don't think that's because he disbelieved Rebecca, but he was probably amazed that somebody would come up and see his beautiful young sister and that um, he didn't say anything rude. He didn't try to make any moves. You know what I mean by that on her. He didn't try to take her by force. He didn't do any of those kind of things. In fact, he gave her pretty expensive jewelry at that time and talk to her with respect, with kindness. And um, that was something that would have been fairly unusual in those particular days and in those times. So Laban notices all of this and probably appreciates it. So she said, thus the man spoke to me. And at this point, Moses doesn't bother to repeat everything. We'll get to that next week. And so he goes to the man. 
And the man is standing there with the camels by the well. And so uh, think about it. He's looking at this guy. And this guy has come on a long journey, but he's got, what is it, 10 camels? That's impressive. Not everybody had 10 camels. You must be either very wealthy and established, or you come from a clan, from a household, a family, we might say, that is well-to-do and established. Now, why would that be important? Well, are you going to send your sister or your daughter off if you have that kind of fatherly care over there with just any old bum that shows up? You're going to show, uh, send her off with somebody who might be faking it? Eliezer does all of this to be impressive. He has his servants with him. He has the gold and the uh, jewelry that he puts upon Rebecca. He has all of these camels because he wants to make a statement wants them to know I'm not just some fly-by-night hobo or bum or street person or something like that. I'm somebody and I represent somebody and somebody that is very important. And so you can imagine Laban as he comes out, he's heard the story. There's a man out there by the well. And then when he sees the man and he sees what he's wearing and he sees the camels and the camels are evidently loaded down with a lot of cargo, Wow, this is something, this is impressive. This guy is for real. So women in that day might not even be consulted, and yet she is. And marriage, marriages in those days were a lot of times little more than business transactions. For example, it might be based upon politics. Here's King A, and he's been at war with King B. So how does he settle it so that they can have peace? Well, King A marries the daughter of King B. And if they agree together, then King B is not going to attack King A, nor is King A going to attack King B. Why? They're related now. And King B has grandchildren living in uh, King A's house. He's not going to attack his grandchildren. And kings did that all the time. Solomon, that's one of the reasons he had so many wives. A lot of times it was political. I'll marry Pharaoh's daughter, so Pharaoh will be favorable to me and won't attack politics. Sometimes it was because of the dowry. Here's a poor guy. He doesn't know how he's going to pay his taxes. He doesn't know how he's going to buy food for his uh, goats or sheep or horses or whatever he has. He doesn't know how he's going to educate his children. And then somebody comes up and says, I really think a lot of your daughter and my dad is really rich and we will give you a lot of money for uh, the privilege to marry your daughter. And all of a sudden the man goes, cha-ching, all my problems are solved. Of course, take her, you know, and uh, give me the money. And it, it was not always done out of love and romance or anything like that. Sometimes it was simply because somebody needed the money. And in India today, they still do that. And uh, we know of a situation in India where there was conflict between the families because in the northern part of Ind India where the girl was from, the uh, groom's family paid the dowry. And in the southern part of India where the groom was from, the uh, bride's family paid the dowry. And so they didn't get along too well. There was always a dispute on that. Still works today in some cultures and some uh, situations. Sometimes it would be done for trade agreements. I will give you my wife, if, um, pardon me, my wife, my daughter, if you will promise to buy all your lumber from me, if you will get all of your camels from me or something like that. There were all kinds of reasons, but in this particular situation, something indeed seems to be different. And so she was to be willing, remember the oath made to Abraham or Eliezer would, uh, would be free from the oath, it would become null and void. And so the jewelry magnified or signified his good intentions. This is an honorable man. His intentions are good and the relationship would be moral. This is going to be a real marriage and it was signifying that the groom came from a family that could indeed take care of her. So everything is clear and everything is understood and it's very, very respectful. See all of that? Number three, hospitality was rightly given and received. In that culture, 
Hospitality was a big, big deal. And because Eliezer was a respected man from a well-to-do clan, and uh, they were related, in fact, Abraham's clan with uh, Laban's clan, they wanted to, you know, put on a good show. They wanted to show that kind of respect. And so he says, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house. Well, he did that pretty quick, didn't he? And a place for the camels. And so he came into the house and he unloaded the camels. I don't know what all they had on them, but a lot of stuff. Provided straw and feed for the camels. And then there was water to wash the feet uh, of Eliezer and the men who were with him. So the invitation is given and it is accepted. Now notice it's given out of respect. They want to honor him, not simply out of obligation. And it certainly wasn't out of pity. But notice that he went and provided maximum effort, not just minimum effort. He was really doing it right and wanted to make sure because that's what shows favor. That's why we want to make sure if we have guests in our home, we don't want to do the minimum. We want to do a little bit extra and we want to show honor to them. Well, it was the same way back then as well. And it was very gratefully received. Eliezer, I'm sure he was glad to get off of that camel. As I've joked before, Sammy and I rode a camel when we were in Israel. That is not a smooth ride. And they've been on this for a long time. They're ready to get off the camels. The camels are ready to be unloaded. Can you imagine how that felt? And they were ready to sit down for a good home-cooked meal. This is nice. Get their feet washed and everything. Clean up a little bit. And so that brings us to number four. Eliezer's priority was his master's business. You know, that rings true. Jesus, when he was in the temple, when he was 12... And Mary and Joseph, they all thought he was with the other one. And then they realized he's missing and they go back. Jesus said, didn't you realize that I must be about my father's business? I mean, that's the way we ought to be too, folks. We ought to be thinking about the father's business. What has he commanded us to do? What would he have us to do? It's not just about how much stuff we can amass. It's not just simply about how comfortable we can be or how much we can enjoy life. What is the Father's business, and do we even care about any of that? And so there's food set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told about my errand. And so he, Laban, said, speak on. And so nothing would deter him from his assignment, not even food. And you know they had to have been hungry. Duty came before comfort. And that's what a good soldier will always do. I do my duty before I have any kind of comfort. I stay out here on guard duty all night. I protect the post. I do what I'm supposed to do. Then I can eat and then I can sleep and then I can shower and change clothes. And that's the way Eliezer was. Duty comes first. I'm going to obey my master first. It'd be nice if Christians had that same uh, mentality as well, wouldn't it? And Abraham, notice here that in spite of all of this, he's not overshadowed and he is not forgotten. It would be easy to kind of go, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this is, and they wouldn't know. And Eliezer could have pretended that oh, these are all my camels and this is all my jewelry. And uh, Eliezer maybe even could have pulled the shenanigan to where he took Rebecca maybe to be his wife and just went to a different part of the desert and never went back to Abraham or anything like that at all. But Eliezer didn't act independently of Abraham. In fact, we'll see as we go through this narrative, every time you turn around, he's talking about his master. He's talking about Abraham. He's talking about his assignment. And so he never was far away from all of that. And I think as Christians, we know the Great Commission. We just don't think about it. We don't really think that that is our assignment, and yet it is. We know we're supposed to glorify God, but we don't really get it that that is our true assignment. You mean in everything? Yeah, in everything. Well, how long do I have to do it? Until Jesus returns or until you die. It's a never-ending thing. And Eliezer understood that far better than we do. Well, let's make a conclusion here and think about these things. You need to biblically define your purpose and you need to stick to it. 
You know, sometimes we uh, find our spiritual gift. Well, that's cool. I'm glad to know that, but we never put it into operation. And in Romans, it talks about those gifts, those motivational gifts. And it says, having these gifts, let us use them. But how many people don't? Because they don't care. And they're not really a part of anything. Let it define your purpose. Know who you are in Christ and then live accordingly. And judge everything that you do in line with the position that you hold. And number two, notice this. Authority and family was honored. And I think today it is still a wonderful thing when a young man wants to go out on a date with a young lady that he asks her father's permission to do that first. That he asks the father's hand uh, for the hand of his daughter in marriage. I think we ought to respect family. And that's why we don't have sex outside of marriage. That's why we don't just have multiple wives. That's why we respect the um, institutions that God has put here on earth. We need to remember those kind of things because it's very important. Thirdly, Rebecca was honored as a human. You know, women today through pornography and uh, all kinds of other uh, ungodly, immoral, uh, nasty things, women have kind of become objects. And in their quest to become equal with men, they are being more and more objectified, abused, and used, and dishonored. And they should not be that way. Rebecca was honored as a human, made in the image of God, and, listen to this, an integral part of the covenant with Abraham. I mean, this is a big deal, folks. She's not just fulfilling something that any woman could do. She's a chosen one for Isaac, and that's the one through whom the blessing is going to come. This is very important. And number four, to follow Eliezer's model, when you go to work next time you do, work for the success of those that employ you. And we ought to be known as Christians, as the hardest workers. We ought to be making our company that we work for or our boss, we ought to be making them successful. In fact, I think we ought to make ourselves indispensable, kind of like Joseph did with Potiphar. Make yourself indispensable and uh, don't just look at it with resentment and don't just look, try to do the minimum and don't be lazy. Have a good work ethic. It's very, very important to do that. And we as Christians ought to be like Eliezer, setting the example so somebody, when they read the story of our life, it's an honorable thing in everything that we do. And so this is all about the faithfulness of God and those who see the faithfulness of God and they honor God because of that. How much more should we as believers, how much more should we who know Christ, who read the Bible and have the Bible, how much more should we honor God in everything that we do? Because we are told that uh, whatever we do, whether we eat or whether we drink, whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God. The big things, the spiritual things, the secular things, the everyday mundane things, all to the glory of God. So how are you doing on that? That's difficult to do. We're so easily distracted. But I thank you for your time, and I pray that God gives you insight into this lesson. And may we learn from Eliezer, the uh, steward of Abraham, the servant of Abraham, and his faithfulness to his master, that we might serve our ultimate master in the same way. Thank you for your time. I pray the Lord will bless you, and we will certainly see you next week.